Michael Rutt, are you there? Yes, sorry, it, you know, it made me install all kinds of updates and things, but uh, here I am. That's, that's typically how it goes. I get it. I get it. Hopefully I don't lose you here with this. Well, welcome, Mike. We're so grateful that you're here. Um, I know you're busy because I've heard rumor that you're writing a book or something. Uh, uh, <laughs> well, I'm uh, I'm done writing it. I'm just going through doing the audio. And uh, so just about uh, done. I think I've got about 11 more chapters to record. That is awesome. Well, we are here tonight at the Lynn and Karen Wilkie Book Club group. And the book that, that our group has chosen to do this uh, first book is Daniel 11. And I understand you know something about that book. So, uh, yes, yeah, so I do. I, I asked everyone to submit questions uh, that we could give you as we talked about it. And I've kind of gone through some of those questions. Um, but before I do, I know that you're, you said you're, you're done with book two, your, your volume on Enoch. And uh -huh. Tell me how how different is book two from book one? What what can we expect in book two? Are our minds <laughs> float even more in book two? <laughs> well, um, so I don't know if I mean if you've read the actual book of Enoch, I mean I'm just you know continuing you know Enoch's journey through this you know book and it's pretty incredible the. This section is about the, the book of parables. And, you know, in the book of parables, this is where we're introduced to this character called the Son of Man, which, you know, is absolutely incredible stuff. It talks about Christ's life, what he'll be like, what he will do, um, talks about him both before uh, he was born and what happens to him after he was born or or after he uh, um, after mortality is over. And it's just I mean, it's far reaching doctrines, things that, you know, we don't often consider. But given that Enoch saw these things and in the context in which he saw them, you have to start, you know, thinking, well, how does this how does this fit what does it mean and it's it's just awesome it's 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 really cool i i, I think it's really cool but uh there's some really interesting stuff in it. so yeah well I, I i remember telling you after reading uh your book of enoch i said to you mike if this had been the first book you had written you wouldn't have been able to write any more because people <laughs> would not be prepared for it. So it was excellent. And I think most of the people or everyone here has heard of it. Many of the people that are here tonight have actually read the book of Enoch and are really excited about book two. Mm -hmm. So let's jump into Daniel 11. Okay. So let me start, Michael, by asking you, what would you say to those who claim the book of, of Ezra is just an allegory or that it had nothing to do with the last days but instead the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD? Um, well, someone that I, I would be curious to understand their reasons for thinking that. I mean, who do they, how do they think that those feathers could be reconciled to Jewel, uh, Jewish leaders or if they're you know, assuming uh, Roman emperors? I just don't see it. I don't see how that could possibly fit, given that you know there were multiple. It's it really comes down to the second feather in this series that serves twice as long as anyone else, and that just never happened in Rome. Um, so how do you how do you reconcile that with yeah. the history of Jerusalem? I just I don't see how it would work. Yeah, I have heard people make those kind of comments, and I just kind of scratch my head. So let's do this. Let's jump in. If you can take just a few minutes and explain the Ezra's Eagle prophecy as you understand it. Sure. So um, when you look in the Apocrypha, and this is, 
you know, a lot of people they hear about the uh, the word apocrypha and they immediately shut down, which you know is is too bad because what is the Bible that we have if not just a compilation of a bunch of different uh, sacred texts that were compiled, you know, about you know 300 A.D. There were versions of the Bible before that had more books. I mean, the brass plate certainly had more books than the Jewish Bible. Um, and the apocryphal writings are just ancient documents that have some maybe historical inaccuracies. Uh, that's true for uh, the book of Ezra as well. They've got you know, certain things that are out of order, but those could just be you know, scribal uh, errors. A lot of these ancient documents were transcribed numerous times. And if someone's not, you know, paying attention, they could easily, you know, put in clerical mistakes. I mean, you look at the Bible itself, the New Testament, you have all kinds of these little, you know, differing uh, spins on stories like, you know, Saul on the road to um, persecute the Christians sees Christ and there's various different accounts that say the people that were with him saw or heard and other people say they didn't see, they didn't hear. So, I mean, there's just the fact that there are some inconsistencies in some of these ancient texts shouldn't shock anybody. Um, but the apocryphal texts, there are 14 books, they were included in the King James Bible uh, and they were in there for up until just right before the turn of the 20th century when the Church of England said, okay, we're going to take these books out. But everyone who went across the plains had the Apocrypha in their Bibles. So that's one of the reasons that why Joseph Smith asked the Lord, hey, should I be translating the Apocrypha? And the Lord surprisingly told him, you don't need to, it's mostly correct anyway. Um, and those people that read the Apocrypha with the Spirit will be able to you know benefit uh from it are you still there phil you just disappeared yes i just turned off my video but I'm still oh, here. Oh, okay <laughs> all of a sudden i feel very lonely <laughs> I, i'm still here and there are many many other people here as well <laughs> okay so um that's a little background on the apocrypha itself again this is these writings are things that the saints would have been familiar with as they were, you know, coming across the plains. It's just more recently, since none of our King James uh, Bibles include this, you know, it has more of a stigma uh, than it probably should. And anyway, when you you take the Apocrypha, there's actually seven, or specifically Second Esdras. Um, you there are seven different visions that Ezra had, and the vision of Ezra's eagle, or what I call Ezra's eagle, is one of these seven visions. All seven visions that Ezra had are awesome, but this particular vision, uh, we're told that it, given that Daniel did not see this specific thing, even though in Daniel 11. He sees basically from his day to the second coming. The angel says, this particular portion wasn't expounded to your brother Daniel. Therefore, I am going to expound it to you now. And then he shows Ezra this vision of a country. And it's represented by an eagle with three heads and 20 feathers. Sometimes in the vision, it refers to them as wings. Sometimes it refers to them as feathers. I don't know if this is just, you know, some corruption that's, you know, gotten into the text or if it's translation errors or what. But whether it's feathers or wings, the gist is the same. There are a certain number of these feathers, all of which we're told represent consecutive leaders of this country that's represented by the eagle. And Ezra is told by an angel who is, you know, guiding him through this vision that this eagle represents a country that 
uh, the domain of this country will spread over the entire globe. And the administration of these 12 feathers or leaders of this country, it doesn't say that these this country will only have 20 feathers, but the vision starts with 20 feathers and it's consecutive from the first feather forward. So given you know the, the presence of the United States, we've had quite a few. How do you know where to start? And, and you know, first, when I was looking at this, uh, most people believed that this vision related to Rome. <clears throat> and so, in fact, lots of people even said that it related to the Roman Catholic Church and that the feathers were you know, related to popes and things like that. But as you go through, you know, you, whether it's popes or it's Roman emperors, and you try to, there are some very specific uh, prophecies relating to these feathers that just seem to break down when you look at Rome specifically or, or frankly, any other country, with the exception of the United States of America, which is, you know, our national symbol is also the eagle. So that's very curious. Now, it says that it doesn't really say much about the first feather, but it says that the second feather in this series of 20 leaders will serve twice as long as anyone else, and that before the end of his you know, time appears, no one will be able to serve unto the half of his, um, his time. So when you look at U.S. presidents and you say, okay, is there a U.S. president that served twice as long as anybody else and who before their last term in office, because presidents serve for terms, was there something that happened that prohibited anyone else from serving um, unto half of uh, his time in office? Now, it's important some people get caught up on the word unto. And when you look at in the Webster's 1828 dictionary, yeah, that's a that's a great biblical source because it's the closest dictionary that we have to the King James Bible English. And it defines unto as exceeding. So what this prophecy is saying is that nobody will exceed half of this second person's time in office. So you look at presidents of the United States, and there is clearly one president who, and only one, that has been elected to four terms in office. There has no, all other presidents of the United States have only ever been elected to two terms. And before uh, Roosevelt's last term in office, he actually died of natural causes in his fourth term. But before his fourth term uh, was over, the I believe it was the 21st Amendment was passed to the Constitution that limited all future presidents to two terms in office. So this doesn't sound like it could kind of be a fit. It sounds exactly like what Ezra saw. Another very curious thing um, is that in the in the next series, the this angelic guide tells Ezra, listen, before the midpoint of this timeline approaches, two of these feathers will be cut short. And it defines feathers as either short feathers or ordinary feathers. An ordinary feather is a president who served his his full or his normal term in, in office. Me, the contrary feathers, it specifically says contrary, meaning there was something contrary that happened, something unnatural that happened to, to end other people's time in office, whereas they should have 
been in office for longer than that. Now, according to this, I mean, dying of natural causes is in uh, while you're still in office is not caused to be a contrary feather, but having the whole premise, I believe, of this vision and the reason why it starts with uh, Herbert Hoover is uh, symbolic of the rise of secret combinations within the United States of America. When you look at Herbert Hoover, Herbert Hoover was one of the founders of an organization within the United States called the Council on Foreign Relations. And Ezra Taft Benson spoke in general conference. And if you want to hear this, you have to actually watch the YouTube video of this because they've edited it out of the actual script. But in his, when you listen to him giving the, his conference talk, he tells, he says, every Latter-day Saint needs to read this book. None dare call it a conspiracy. And the whole premise of this book is that this Council on Foreign Relations was the rise of secret combinations within America. And ever since this um, organization was established, it has dominated American politics on both sides of the aisle and has controlled um, the person who is in, uh, in the office. Now, so that's, I, I believe, why this begins there. So these contrary feathers are people, I believe, my opinion on this is, contrary feathers have had their administrations cut short as a result of the meddling of these secret combinations in America. And as I mentioned, the angel said, before the midpoint of this timeline approaches, two of these leaders will have had their administrations cut short by meddlings of the secret combinations. And you can look at this list of presidents and you can see that you know, FDR and Richard Nixon both had their uh, presidential terms in office cut short by unnatural means, assassination and being forced to resign. And if you look into the whole Watergate uh, scenario, there is all kinds of peculiarities there um, that you know I'm not going to get into here, but um, when you look at when Richard Nixon was forced out of office compared to all 20 of these feathers, he, he represents the midpoint. Um, so that lines up perfectly with this prophecy as well. Now, according to uh, this prophecy, every all other presidents up unto uh, President Trump were normal presidents. They're the um, machinations of the secret combinations wouldn't force them out of office. Now that changed with Donald Trump. Jo Donald Trump, according to this prophecy, was a short feather president. So you look at, you know, President Trump and some people will say, well, look, I mean, he served his full term in office. Well, according to this prophecy, something would have had to have happened to cut him short. And if you look at all the elections that this country has ever had, we have never had up until this election um, where a president has had so much you know, nebulous activity involved in a presidential election. I mean, when you when it comes to the electoral college, I mean, that's what this whole January sixth thing, you know, all of these lawsuits are are, are going on about. And you know, you had over ten percent of all states sent alternate get delegates to the electoral college, saying, "Listen, there was widespread fraud in our states. Do not count those um, electoral votes." use our alternates instead. It's just, I mean, crazy. Nothing like this has ever happened on the scope or scale. So according to what um, Ezra saw in this vision, Donald Trump's presidency would have had to have been cut short by the machinations of the secret combination. 
And that must have happened through election fraud. Now, the prophecy says that President Biden's term in office will, that he will be away sooner than Trump was. And specifically, it says that there will be two other feathers, the next two short feathers, that will be thinking in their hearts to be set up. And before they can be set up, the three eagle heads awake and devour all three of these uh, feathers at the same time. So when you think about what that means, now that you know the political environment is what it is and we are in the middle of an election process and you can see just, I, I don't care what your political views are, you know, some people, it's it's shocking. Their political views are so hot and heavy that they cannot see things for what they really are. But, you know, never have you had the opposite party able to just do lawsuit after lawsuit after lawsuit to a potential, you know, presidential candidate in a blatant orchestrated strategy to impact the outcome of the election, to sway public opinion, to try to paint the person in a negative light. It's it's incredible. And according to this, this prophecy, to me, it sounds like this prophecy knew that there was going to be a three-way presidential race because you've got Biden, who is the incumbent president, and you have two others that think in their hearts to be set up. So that means there's three people in this. And you look at the presidential race right now and you have three candidates. I mean, I think that, uh, you know, Robert uh, uh, Kennedy <laughs> Jr., how, how curious is it that both his father and uncle were killed by the machinations of this secret, you know, combination in America? So, I mean, I think that, it's a fascinating prophecy. It's got, uh, you know, a, you know, big, you know, milestone that's coming up. I mean, it's set it, within this, the wording of the prophecy, these things have to happen before January, you know, uh, 20th, 21st uh, of 2025. Uh, otherwise, Biden will have been in office, you know, for longer than Trump now. I know there's all kinds of people saying all kinds of crazy things about Biden. And frankly, it's it's hard not, not to you know, scratch your head and go, well, geez, yeah, <laughs> I wonder. I mean, we've never really had, you know, somebody that has been, you know, quite like President Biden in office right now. <clears throat> people say he, he left office uh, quite a while ago. And he's not really <laughs> running the country. And that's interesting, Mike, because I've heard people say, and it's primarily people that are so hopeful that you've got it right. Um, that that if Biden is if the Joe Biden, the man, is in office after January, um, that they still believe that his mentally he's no longer running the country, or maybe never was running the country. Mm -hmm. Um, so who knows if that's part of it? I I I don't like that logic i would rather go for the fact that he's probably not going to serve his full term and i think people who look at what's happened with biden that's that's not a stretch that's a strong possibility that he may not serve his full term even before the january 20 uh, 2025 yeah well you know another thing that's very curious about this whole prophecy is that is how it ties in to the book of Daniel in the Old Testament. Um, there's this you know, lion that jumps out of the wilderness, which is curious, and confronts this eagle and states to the eagle, are thou all that is left of the fourth beast? Now, the fourth beast comes from Daniel's revelation, where he saw this fourth kingdom that would be established in the last days that would have dominion over all of the earth. 
and it, it would be oppressive. And, you know, it's, it's the same kind of verbiage that's within uh, the Ezra's Eagle prophecy. These three heads of Ezra's Eagle are going to oppress the world with more oppression than any leader in its history ever has. And that's, that's saying something. So this is very curious for those that are familiar with my other books, the symbolism of, of a lion confronting America, um, purifying America, um, eliminating the um, eagle heads, the, the uh, unrighteous dominion, uh, the oppression of the saints. Daniel saw that the saints would be oppressed by um, a horrible leader that would rise in the last days. John the Revelator saw the same thing. You can read that in Revelation 13, where, you know, this, you know, man that speaks incredible blasphemies against the Most High overcomes the saints, uh, performs miracles in the eyes of all people, um, and, you know, people believe him. This is what Christ was talking about when he said, listen, in the last days, if this is in uh, Matthew 24, and the Joseph Smith Matthew in particular, even clarifies it more, says, listen, in the last days, there will be false Christs. That's another way of saying antichrists. And even the very elect according to the covenant will be deceived. So... This is why President Nelson is saying, listen, in the coming day, you're not going to survive unless you have the constant guiding influence of the Holy Ghost, because things are going to be happening that we have no box for. Most people absolutely have no box for what is about to happen, because we're used to world, uh, you know, the world operating on, you know, a Newtonian physics paradigm. But... We need to remember that the world is a supernatural place. God, the most powerful force in the multiverse, is at his core a supernatural being. And the religion that we believe in is at its fundamental core supernatural. There are evil and conspiring forces on this planet that are supernatural. And as we get further into the events of the last days, things are going to become more and more um, crazy and difficult for people to reconcile with, you know, conventional um, history as we have been taught. And so we're really going to need to be grounded in the Holy Ghost to be able to survive because most people have no, no idea. Um, we've, we've got, it's, it's kind of inherent within our culture as a, a human race to when things are weird to just kind of, you know, set them aside and talk about things that are not weird instead. Um, nobody wants to be a, labeled as a conspiracy theorist. Um, so talking about gigantic human beings in the Bible, um, even though that was... Well, that's crazy stuff. Key, that never happened, right? It, it is crazy stuff. Um, and what's crazy is that because it's crazy, we just completely omit it. We don't even really talk about it, even though it's because of Israel's sheer terror of going into the land of Canaan with all of these giants that they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. That's the entire uh, reason that they were wandering in the wilderness. But we do not talk about it because it's weird. Yeah. How did they get there? Well, the ancient documents that talk about these things, they're weird as well. And so best just not to talk about it. And that's what we do. And so we have no box for any of these things. And we are absolutely ill prepared for what is about to come. And Mike, can you hold your thought one sec? Because I want to ask you something really quick. I made a note um, in, in your last book, you use the term multiverse a lot. And I've had this conversation with you 
I think when a lot of people hear the term multiverse, they're thinking Marvel Comics, that there's another Michael Rush somewhere else. And while that would be incredible, I don't think that's what you mean. Can you define when you say multiverse what you mean? Yeah, so no, I'm, I'm talking about this from like the theoretical uh, physics perspective that, you know, there are parallel dimensions where, you know, I, I mean, think about it, the spirit world, we are told is on this earth, yet we don't see it. Um, it's got to be in a different dimension. And how many dimensions are there? I mean, there's within those dimensions there, you know, are they in little boxes or are they endless just like our, you know, more this mortal dimension is. And so there's there's not an infinite number of copies of me, thank goodness, um, throughout the, the, the multiverse. That's not what this means at all. There are potentially, I mean, this is this is you know all you know theoretical. I mean, we do not have all of these answers, but the more that we get into this, the more that you know we the answers seem to be pointing to there are other dimensions, and those other dimensions have to be, you know, universes unto themselves. And so there's not one universe, there's multiple. So it's a multiverse. Um, so that's that is what I am talking about here. I'm not talking about, you know, multiple different versions of our reality as we understand it. Yeah. Uh, there are literally multiple um, universes that, you know, have incredible things going on. I mean, there the the laws of physics you know as we understand them could be completely different in a different uh um universe i mean as soon, uh, when you start getting to the quantum level newtonian physics absolutely breaks down anyway so it it's almost as if newtonian physics is simply just a law the law of god saying do this and it's doing that um because when you get to the quantum level things are, are are totally different so that's when i talk about the multiverse um that is what i'm talking about and and in volume two of enoch enoch actually talks about things that are just i mean the only way that you can describe some of these things is to get into some of these theoretical concepts and you know it's it's actually just flabbergasting uh you know case in point um in volume two I mean, if you've read volume one you you know about the lady right if you haven't um well then you don't know what i'm talking about um but in volume two Enoch talks about the lady and talks about where she came from and you know what you know s some very very interesting things that that you know you have to broaden your theoretical framework um and you realize listen there is much more to this universe than we understand there's much much more to it than the um, earth and the spirit world and the celestial kingdom. There's there is much much more to it. Yeah, we haven't even we haven't even explored the depths of all of our oceans, you know. And we're trying to go to other planets now, and we don't even know that much about our own planet. So yeah, I, I have a couple of questions I want to ask you. So you you brought up the lady, and you don't mention the lady in the book of Daniel. Um, but it's not fair for you to bring that up and not tell us who the lady is uh, for those who haven't read that. So just let's let's sidetrack just a little bit. And I want you to do two things. Talk just kind of briefly an overview of the lady. And then I would like you to talk a little bit more about the Antichrist. You refer to him as the stout horn, as the uh, scriptures do. So if you can briefly talk about those two topics, that would be awesome. Okay. 
So I'm going to try to stay high level and you can, you can ask more probing questions and I'll go as deep as you want. Um, so if you have no idea who the lady is, then I encourage you to break out your Google and thumb on, and type in Marian apparition. And you will find a, an incredibly long list. Just go to the wiki. wiki there's a Wikipedia. Wiki. How do you say that? Wikipedia. <laughs> Wikipedia. Wikipedia. Okay. There's a Wikipedia page that is dedicated to Marian apparitions. And what a Marian. 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 Sorry. Marian apparition. Just want to make sure everybody got that. Marian. Apparition as in ghost and Marian as in Mary, the mother of Jesus Christ. Marian apparition. So you look up this and you're going to see throughout history all kinds of sh shockingly well-documented instances in where a woman who is almost exclusively described as the lady who appears to people and requests churches to be built in her name, requests prayers to be built in her or offered in her name, uh, requests necklaces and medallions and different kinds of jewelry to be worn in her honor. Um, it's, it's a very bizarre, um, perhaps one of the most famous Marian apparition uh, is Our Lady of Fatima in Portugal. There was recently a movie done about this. This happened in, I want to say, 1917 to 1919, something like that, where this um, lady appears to three shepherd children in Fatima, Portugal, and starts telling these children these incredible prophecies. And the children tell the people, their, their parents, and it spreads like wildfire through Fatima, Brazil, and, or uh, Portugal. And, you know, the, the town is upset uh, that, I mean, they don't know what to make of this. I mean, who is this lady? And some of the prophecies that these kids say, you know, actually start coming to pass and it starts freaking people out. And so there's, you know, one crowd that is, you know, saying the children are possessed with devils and this, that, and the other. There's another crowd that are venerating these children like they're saints and, you know, it's it's really hard for their families. And so the lady appears to these children and says, listen, you tell the people of the town that on this date, I will appear to whoever is there. And so this spreads throughout Portugal and the world. Um, and so come this day, where the lady has said that she is going to appear, there are, the estimates are somewhere between 30 and over 100,000 people gathered in this, in and around Fatima, Portugal. And it's a cloudy day. I mean, there's scientists, there's government officials, there's, you know, curious folks from throughout Europe that, you know, have gathered to see what's going to happen. And included in my volume one of Enoch, I have a scientist who was present, who was not, you know, a religious man. And I include his eyewitness account of what happened. And it's pretty shocking. So he's there, it's cloudy, and people are, you know, kind of, bored waiting for something to happen and nothing's happening and then all of a sudden he says the sun comes through the clouds and not like the clouds melt away he says the sun 
pierces through the clouds and is dancing around in the sky. Now, there is no way that the sun, which is a million miles, at, you know, has a, a diameter of one million miles, has punched through the cloud layer of Fatima Brazil and is dancing around in the sky. Um, but this is what they saw. And the scientist really thinks it's the sun. And he feels the heat. It lights up everybody's, you know, he, he actually says that he starts laughing because the light from this orb, this brilliant orb, casts this sickly glow on all the people and it makes them look grotesque. And he's he finds it to be very humorous how weird the light makes people look. And it's dancing around, darting all over the sky, and everyone is shocked. They cannot believe it. And then the orb starts coming right towards the people and everyone starts panicking. They, they think the sun is going to collide with the earth. And then it's gone. And people have, they call it the miracle of the sun to this day. So what that was, you know, it's, you're going to have to do your research. But when you look at these numerous counts of these Marian apparitions, they are typically associated with a woman who is clearly a spirit. She's not tangible. You can, you can see her, but she's ethereal. She is often accompanied by glowing orbs. Now, you know, I, I think that's kind of, she's, she's clearly not the mother of Jesus Christ, but she's appearing with such frequency that you have got to ask yourself, how does this fit? And when you look at the Catholic church, and I mean, you go into Walmart these days, you can see all of these Catholic candles on those candles you will often see depictions of the lady and different instances where she has appeared to different parts of the world. And there have been these little monuments that have been built in her honor. And people are literally praying and venerating to uh, her. Um, they refer to her as the queen of heaven. Uh, there are prayers to the queen of heaven. And I mean, when you go back over time, the history of this woman becomes very, very, very interesting. Um, so, uh, Phil, is that is that enough detail? <laughs> okay, yeah, you can leave everybody hanging. They'll have to get the next book. That's great. Well, well we could be okay. talking about this all night. I, I do have to pick up my daughter from the airport in an hour and 15 minutes. Okay. So uh, we okay. can spend this however you want. Let's jump into two two things, and I'll, and and if you need to go after, right after, that's fine. Uh, two things. I want you to talk a little bit about the stout horn. One of the questions is, uh, where is he from? And mm -hmm. the other one is, uh, if you can talk a little bit about the lost tribes and their return, maybe where they are and what manner of transportation will they use when they return? Okay. So a lot of people particularly in the LDS community, are uncomfortable with the idea that there even is an Antichrist. That's curious to me, given that in the Book of Mormon, when you read what happened to the Nephite government right before Christ came, and you read the chapter heading that describes Jacob, they describe Jacob as an Antichrist. And this antichrist overthrew their government and the book of mormon is a template for our day so if you're unfamiliar with the concept of the antichrist I mean, hopefully you are not unfamiliar with it given that you have just read daniel 11. but second thessalonians chapter 2 talks about the antichrist the book of daniel talks about the antichrist in multiple chapters 
Um, Revelations chapter 13 talks about the Antichrist. Chapter 17 talks about the Antichrist. Um, the Isaiah chapters within the Book of Mormon talk about the Antichrist. Um, probably the most famous sermon that we have on the second coming, Matthew 24, talks about the Antichrist. So the belief that there will be no Antichrist is astounding to me um, because it's there is a it's comfortable it's far more comfortable to project the past upon the future and say you know the past was normal the future will be normal the things are going to get a little crazy but it's going to be crazy like what we've seen in the past now if you open up your scriptures to daniel chapter 12 uh, verse 1 um, you will see that, you know, Michael is present in that verse. And at the time that Michael comes, and we know that Michael is coming to Adam on Diomedon, um, at that time, it says that there will be a time of trouble that will be greater since any time there was a nation. And you look through the annals of recorded history, and there have been some really awful times on planet Earth, but according to that passage, nothing will compare to this time of trouble. And the reason for that is this Antichrist, who will overcome the saints. And in fact, you know, given that you have read Daniel 11, there's this very specific passage in Daniel 11 that says that he will, this Antichrist will overcome the prince of the covenant, which is very curious because the Antichrist is absolutely not going to overcome Jesus Christ. So who's the prince of the covenant? The prince of the covenant is a person who holds the keys to administer the ordinances of the covenant. That prince will be overcome along with the saints. That should give you pause. This is we're not talking about some general, you know, rising opposition to Christianity in general. We are talking about something that is very targeted and specifically towards the saints. Go back to 1 Nephi chapter 14. In that chapter, this is Nephi seeing the vision of what's going to happen in America. He sees that there will be a war against the Lamb of God and that there will be a war against the saints. And that the saints will be endowed with great power from on high. Okay, because of the supernatural wickedness that will be taking place on the earth in this day when the Antichrist is present. And I mean, if you read in the book of Revela Revelation what the Antichrist can do, I mean, it says that he can cause fire to come down from heaven in the eyes of all people. Think about that. What political figure do you know of right now that can cause fire to come down in the eyes of all people? And friends, we're not talking about a bomb or a laser. And we're, we're talking about something that is so impressive that people are shocked. I mean, we're, we're talking about fire coming down and consuming Elijah's offering kind of a scenario here. And because of this, people literally believe that this Antichrist is God. In fact, when you read in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, it says that this man will enter into the temple of God and sit down in the temple of, the God, of God, showing that he himself is God. And people are going to believe that he is God. Okay, so 
we're not talking about any political figure. I think it's laughable when people say, oh, the Antichrist is King Charles, or the Antichrist is Elon Musk, or the Antichrist is President Trump. It's like, friends, have you read the scriptures? Because if you have, you have not understood what you've read. We're talking about a being that has such tremendous power that he appears to be magical. So you ask, who is this man? Well, when you read in the book of Daniel, it says that he will, that he has eyes like unto the eyes of a man. And that's very curious. Why didn't why don't why not just say he's got eyes, you know, and assume, yeah, I have eyes. You know, you wouldn't say, wow, Phil, you have eyes like into a man. <laughs> That's just not what you would say. But this is what the angel explains to Daniel about the eyes of this Antichrist, that they will be likened to a man. And he also says something very curious, that he will mingle amongst the seed of men, but that he will not cleave unto them, just as iron does not cleave unto clay. That's weird, right? I mean, why does this guy mingle amongst the seed of men, have eyes like a man, but doesn't mesh with men? Okay, that is that is curious stuff. And if you don't pay attention to kind of the stranger bits in our biblical canon, you really have no box for this. And one of the strangest parts of the Old Testament, without question, is Genesis chapter 6. In it, it talks about, you know, the sons of God who look at the daughters of men, that they are beautiful, and they, you know, take wives from the sons of men. I mean, or from the daughters of men. I mean, why are you saying that? That's weird to say. Yeah, I don't, you know, refer to my kids this way. That's it. when you use this kind of language, when you are, you know, drawing a distinction, and that's that's really interesting because that that whole Genesis chapter six it comes right out of the book of Enoch, um, and the book of Enoch gives much more information on who the children of heaven. There's many different translations for this. The uh, they're called the sons of God. They're called the children of heaven. They're called Different translations have them as uh, the Anunnaki, uh, which literally means the sons of An. An was the the chief god. It's another way of saying the sons of God. Uh, or also the watchers. Daniel talks about the watchers. Um, if you uh, look up the word watcher, you'll see that in Daniel's writings, he refers to to someone who comes to the earth from the heavens as being a watcher. So the whole premise of the book of Enoch, this is in the very opening verses. Enoch says, hey, the whole reason I am writing this book is for the elect that will be living in the last days during the times of trouble. Because what I'm going to write about as happening in my day is going to happen again in your day. So unless you have this kind of an understanding about, and I'll tell you what, the ancient world, the, the recorded history of the ancients is filled with this stuff. The Bible makes so much more sense when understood in the context of the ancient literature and understanding and religious philosophies of the ancient world. We don't have that. And so these things 
they're they're out of context and we we don't understand them because we lack that context with that is needed in order for us to understand them so unless you know this you have no idea who this this antichrist is going to be um but if you do understand these things and enoch's writings then that that is a pretty good place to start now i know that if you're hearing this kind of stuff for the first time you're going holy cow phil what in the heck did you why do you invite this crazy guy uh for i mean look in doctrine and covenants section 107 in that section which was received after the pearl of great price was already given to us it states that the prophecies regarding the last days were recorded in the book of enoch which will be testified of in due time when joseph received that revelation the book of enoch was lost people in america could not go to their bookstore and get the book of enoch uh it was it had just recently come to light in europe um and it it wasn't until you know years later that it actually came to america and we didn't get our first accurate translation of the book of enoch until you know the 1900s and that's the version that i have based my uh, enoch commentary on and they have since i mean the the ethiopian church they had the book of enoch all along um the the ethiopians i mean if you look in the the scriptures the ethiopians and the jews had a strong connection um i mean the queen of ethiopia had a child with king solomon and so they always you know their royalty at least considered themselves as being part of the house of israel and you go to ethiopia i mean you'll you'll see that that is part of their culture and so they safeguarded a lot of these you know records and held them them sacred you you remember in the new testament philip is told by the spirit to go and preach the gospel to an Ethiopian eunuch who is reading Isaiah. And he teaches Isaiah uh, the meaning of the Isaiah's words to this Ethiopian eunuch. And the eunuch says, baptize me. He's baptized. And then Philip is, you know, taken by the spirit to another place, you know, um, a couple days journey away. So, I mean, it's the, there is this relationship with Ethiopia yeah, in antiquity, that you know is one of the reasons that they safeguarded so many of these you know ancient documents. So you know, that's a little history on you know the kind of the scriptural accounts for the uh, the Antichrist, who he is, what he's you know uh, going to do. Um, but honestly, it sounds crazy when you hear someone talking about it like me. You've got to do your own homework. I mean, there, I can show you in the scriptures multiple examples where people wanted to talk about this and the Lord shuts them down and says, you don't talk about this. Um, and you, you look at, you know, President Nelson today, he, he drops these bombshells and doesn't expound on them. You know, did you, have you ever noticed that? I mean, like when he says, yeah, you're not going to survive the coming day unless you have the kinds of guiding influence of the Holy Ghost. And then he moves on. Like, whoa, whoa, what about the coming day is going to, we're not going to survive. I mean, what's going to change? You know, he, he invites us to study these different kinds of things. One of the things that he said, um, very few people actually did this, was he said, listen, spend the next six months studying the covenants that the Lord has made with the house of Israel. And if you do, you will be astonished. Talk with your friends about these covenants. Then look for their fulfillment in your life. 
He also said that in the coming days, we will see the greatest miracles that the Lord has ever performed. All of these things, these incredible bombshells that he just drops and then moves on, they're all related. They all tie into the exact same things. And this leads us in to the restoration of the house of Israel. So the restoration of the house of Israel is totally different from the gathering of Israel. I don't know if you picked this up, but in general conference, uh, President Nelson referred to both the gathering of Israel and the return of the lost tribes. Those are different. And if you don't understand that difference, you need to understand it. And this is why the 10th article of faith says we believe in the literal gathering of Israel. That is the most important thing happening on the earth right now. The gathering of Israel on both sides of the veil. But that's not all that article of faith says. We believe in the literal gathering of Israel and in the restoration of the lost tribes. That is different. What does it mean to restore and what does it mean to gather? You need to be thinking about those things. We don't, we simply do not spend enough time thinking about the specific words. I mean, the, the prophets were inspired in the wording that they chose. And when Christ talks specifically, uh, I'm talking about, you know, the things that he says to the Nephites in third Nephi. I mean, his phrasing of things is crucial for us to understand. And he, he, he's talking, you know, he went to at great lengths talking about the remnant of Jacob who would come to America and destroy the wicked Gentiles as a lion and that no weapon formed by men would prosper against them. Um, if you don't understand the prophecies of the Old Testament, the prophecies contained within the Isaiah chapters in the Book of Mormon, you're not ready for what's going to happen. And the reason you know, you know, people are cop-outs when it comes to this kind of stuff, um, Christ commanded us to study the words of Isaiah, um, well, it's it's really interesting. You read the first couple of verses of Third Nephi chapter twenty three, and Christ says, "Ye ought to search these things," and then he stops and he corrects himself. How often does Jesus Christ correct himself? He says, "No, a commandment I give you to study the words of Isaiah." That's that's pretty important but you know yet isaiah is weird it's hard to understand it's it's you know strange language um and so we skip over those things and we don't really you know study it you know there are plenty of resources out there you know there are you know we're told in the doctrine and covenants multiple times to seek knowledge and learning from the best books. If you go to the best books about Isaiah, you will understand what those chapters mean. If you don't, you will not. Um, un unless you're, you know, you've really done a lot of uh, history into, you know, ancient, you know, civilizations and things like that. And then these things, you know, the, the mystery begins to uh, disappear. But you go into the these Old Testament prophecies about the restoration of Israel. I mean, Jeremiah, in two separate parts in the book of Jeremiah, he states that the restoration of those in the north countries will rival the exodus of Egypt. That's shocking. That the restoration of the lost tribes that no one's going to talk about when the Lord divided the Red Sea anymore. They're only going to talk about when the Lord restored the lost tribes of Israel. But that's what the scriptures say. And most people don't know any of this. 
And, you know, it's, it's a shame. And one of the primary reasons that this is the case is because we, too many of us, take the philosophy that Lehman and Lemuel had, which was dad's going to tell us everything we need to know. You know, the Lord doesn't talk to us anyways, but dad does. And so if we need to know it, he'll tell us. Nephi took a totally different approach. And look at the first, you know, verse in the Book of Mormon. Nephi talks about he was taught somewhat after all the learning of his father, but that he had obtained a great knowledge of the mysteries of God. How does he obtain a great knowledge of the mysteries of God being only taught somewhat after the learning of his father? It's because his primary teacher was not his father. It was the Lord. And we can be taught by the Lord and we need to be taught by the Lord. And when the when uh, President Nelson is talking to us about, you know, encouraging us to expand our capacities to receive personal revelation and to hear him, uh, this is what it's all about. To me, it seems that the Lord uh, has some constraints on what President Nelson can talk about, uh, just like he put some constraints on you know what Mormon. If you if you read, uh, this is in in Third Nephi chapter twenty six. Mormon was going to write everything that Christ told the Nephites, basically the explanation of what his words meant, and the Lord told him Mormon. You're not writing that. Said, I've given them what I've given them because I'm going to test their faith. And if they will receive what I've given them, then more will be opened up through the Holy Ghost. But if they don't receive what I've given them, it will be to their own condemnation. And to that end, you know, you look in the Doctrine and Covenants, and the Lord tells the entire church that it is under condemnation for taking, treating lightly the things that it has received, specifically saying the Book of Mormon. So we've received the Book of Mormon. It has these incredible narratives that are meant for us to prepare us for what's about to happen. But most of us are absolutely clueless as to what they mean. We have no idea. And because of our ignorance with these things, you know, when people talk about these things, it, it makes us feel uncomfortable and we would prefer just to move on to another subject. Or we say, listen, stay away from the mysteries. But when you, this is, you know, one of the things that, uh, you know, I really talk about quite a bit in the volume two of the Book of Enoch because Enoch talks about it a lot. He refers to the Son of Man as the hidden son, the father's hidden son. Look at the history of earth's dealings with the God of Israel. It's absolutely plain that we have no idea. Most people, most Christians who claim to worship, you know, Jesus Christ, they believe that Jesus Christ literally is the Holy Ghost and literally is God the Father. They have no idea who he really is. I mean, the nature of God. They don't know who they worship. Um, and it has been this way throughout the history of, you know, you know, man's time on earth. It's It's really been very few that have actually had the true nature of the Son of God revealed to them. And the only way to really know who the Son is is to have the Father reveal him unto you. And that happens through the Holy Ghost. It happens through promptings. It's a one-on-one -on -one, um, experience where I'm not saying that God the Father appears to you, okay? That is by far and away the exception to the rule. The vast majority of every single person that will live on the planet is not going to see God the Father or Jesus Christ while, you know, before the millennium. 
it all happens through the administration of the Holy Ghost. And it can happen with anyone who is, you know, honest and and sincere in their seeking. Does that answer your question, Phil? <laughs> I'm just smiling because we could go on forever. I, I know you have some stuff to do, or you got to go pick up your daughter at the airport. Can't think of a more. Well, I, I, I've got about 45 minutes. I don't know oh, how you much. Oh, 45 minutes then. Hey. Um, yeah, I, just, I have to leave at end my time. <laughs> Okay, well, actually, a little bit more about the Lost Tribes. I remember when I first met you, and I jokingly say that uh, you had two albums. You had the white album and the red album, your two versions of your first book. And uh, when I first met you, I remember you asking me a question. You said, Phil, where do you think – I'm going to ask you a question that, that – I'm going to tell you what I think, Phil, but when, when you – when I ask you the question, you're going to think I'm nuts. You said, where do you think the lost 10 tribes are? And I said, well, I'll give you my answer, but you'll probably think I'm nuts. And do you remember what I said? That, that You said that it's, your beliefs absolutely resonate with my own. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're not here. They're not on the earth. Uh, mm -hmm. We know that the Lord took the city of Enoch away. Uh, he probably took uh, Melchizedek's people away. And who knows how many other groups of people were taken off the earth. Uh, and not just the people, but a chunk of the land that they were on. A lot of people believe that the Tower of Babel, they were trying to reach uh, a piece of the earth that was above them, a city that they could see floating above them. So just talk a little bit about why you think the Lost Tribes are not on the earth. Um, okay, so if you look in the Book of Mormon, you know, at the quintessential House of Israel discourse, that's got to go to Jacob chapter 5, right? This is the allegory of the olive tree. When you look at that allegory, it speaks of Israel in terms of three graphs. The first, the second, and the last. So that is very important. It's very insightful. Most people just glance over that. But it also refers to the first being last and the last being first. And when we, we review scriptures that talk about the house of Israel, it's it always quotes the first shall be last and the last shall be first. This you know for a great example of this, read you know Ether chapter thirteen or Jacob chapter five. <laughs> Ether thirteen is shorter, but when you look at what these three different graphs are, you have to you have to know that they these three graphs relate to three different bodies of the house of Israel. And when we look at the history of the house of Israel, there are three different nation states that rose from Israel. You have the kingdom of Judah, you have the northern kingdom of Israel, and you have the Nephite nation in the Americas. Those are the only three um, historic uh, civilizations that are tied to the house of Israel. <clears throat> so when we're talking about these three graphs, we're talking about these three different bodies, Judah, Joseph, and the 10 tribes. So when you look at the first graphs, and you look at this, I think this begins in verse 25 of Jacob 5. It talks about the Lord the master of the vineyard, who is with his servant from the very beginning. This is the master of the vineyard is clearly God the Father. His servant, who is with him from the beginning, is his only begotten son, who is with him from the beginning. So they go down, and it's curious that it's the father who performs the graphs of the house of Israel. So he takes the first graph, which would have to be the first portion of the house of Israel that was taken and 
scattered. And if you read most of the scriptures that talk about the 10 tribes, it talks about them as being led away by the Father. Just look at 3 Nephi 17, verse 4. Um, so in this verse 25, the Lord of the vineyard says to a servant, let's go down and you know check out the first graphs. And they go down and he says, look at these. So this is, this is important. This is where the words within the uh, prophetic verses are of paramount importance to understand. When we're talking about the first graph, he uses the, you know, the word these, meaning there is more than one graph associated with the 10 tribes of Israel. Now, he says that the first of these graphs was grafted in the worst place in the vineyard. Now, clearly the vineyard represents the earth. So we have a portion of the house of Israel that was grafted into the worst location on planet earth. And if you read Book of Enoch, Volume 1, um, and you, I've got some chapters where I talk about, you know, my theory for the migration of the uh, 10 tribes, according to some apocryphal accounts that are very specific. Um, you, you know that, you know, I think that they were led to the north, um, you know, up, you know, probably through Scandinavia to where they hit the Arctic Ocean. Um, and, you know, then there, there's some people there that they have been going through some pretty, pretty country uh, until they get to, to this, you know, frozen wasteland. And the Lord tells them further, build boats, go into that frozen ocean and sell further north. I, my opinion is that you have a group that said, ah, we're done. We saw some really pretty country back there. We're going to, we're going to hang out here. But another group went further north. And you see this in that account in Jacob 5. So you've got you know, one of these first groups that was taken to the worst part of the vineyard, and then another group that was taken to someplace worse than the worst place in the vineyard. How does that make sense? How can you have a portion of the lost tribes that's taken to the worst place on earth, and then another grafting that's taken to someplace worse than that? The only way that that can be is if the place they're taken is no longer on the earth. Now, I know that that sounds weird, but look at, I think it's uh, Deuteronomy 30 or 33, you know, verses one through four. Moses tells, says, listen, there is a portion of you that's going to be taken to the utmost parts of heaven, and the Lord will gather you from there. Uh, you you can read that same thing in I I believe Nehemiah, um, where you know Nehemiah call, remembers that scripture says, "Yeah, you know, Lord, I remember you said that you know if there were any of the house of Israel that were scattered to the utmost parts of heaven, you would you would remember them and and restore them." So. Jacob suggests that they're not here. Um, then you have, in this is in the book of Revelations in chapter 12, you have this incredible vision where um, it starts out with this pregnant woman. And where is this pregnant woman? She's in outer space. Okay, She's standing on the moon. She's clothed with the sun, and she's wearing a crown of 12 stars, okay? The earth isn't even mentioned here. So who, who does the this Revelations 12 say that this man-child is? It well, says that her child is a boy who is destined to rule all the nations, and that the great dragon who was cast down to the earth tried to devour her son, um, but that the son is the son is taken up to the father. Um, 
So clearly we're talking about Jesus Christ. And so this woman has to be the house of Israel. Now, this house of Israel is seen in this vision as being in outer space before Christ is born. So you have at least a remnant of Israel that's described as being in space, wearing a crown. Now, when you go further into this revelation, you hear about this dragon that is furious at being cast down to the earth and wages war against Israel and seeks to overcome it. And Israel is about to be overcome. And the Lord gives Israel the wings of a giant eagle with which she's able to fly away from before the face of the dragon. So the dragon is bound to the earth. So if she can go to a place where the dragon can't get her, and the, the dragon is furious that she's gone, but she's gone, and there's nothing he can do about it because he's bound here. And so the revelation says that in his fury, he makes war with the remnant of her seed that, you know, remains on the earth. <clears throat> so here you have another prophecy that seems to be suggesting that there is a portion of Israel that isn't here anymore. So in the mouth of two or three witnesses, I've given you four, you know, um, Nehemiah, uh, Deuteronomy, Jacob 5, and Revelation 12. Now, think about uh, Doctrine and Covenants section 133. In section 133, it talks about, this is in verse 26 of 133, it talks about those of the North Country who will return with their prophets, okay? And the Lord is going to cast up a highway out of the great deep. Well, why do we call you know, spacecraft spaceships? Well, space, it, it's, it's like an ocean, right? I mean, you have to be airtight uh, in order to venture into the void of space. So casting up a highway you know, out of the great deep, you know, aligns very well uh, with that. Now, if you look at the teachings of the prophet Joseph Smith, he, there is no question that he taught that the lost tribes had been removed from the earth. There are many accounts that say that, and there is one account where somebody interprets what Joseph Smith say, uh, says as them being inside of the earth. But I believe that that is this person's misinterpretation. It's talking about, you know, this, you know, portion of the earth that was like, you know, a, a kettle and that the, you know, lost tribes, you know, are within that. What I, what I think that this guy heard and misunderstood was that there's a portion of the earth that was removed that looks like a kettle and was taken, you know, um, away from the earth. Because, I mean, you have Wilford Woodruff, who talks about Joseph Smith um, speaking of the lost tribes being removed from the earth. You have Brigham Young that says that. You have Parley P. Pratt that says that. You have Eliza R. Snow that says that. I mean, these, these aren't just, you know, run-of-the-mill saints. These are people that were intimately familiar with Joseph Smith and what he taught. And they're all saying, Joseph said the lost ten tribes are not here. They have been removed from the earth. So that, yeah, I, I believe that their return will be, that is one of the reasons why it will rival the exodus of Egypt. Now, when, when you read Daniel 11, you have this confrontation with the Antichrist, where the Antichrist, you know, he gets his, his buns kicked by the ships of Chittim that return. Now, the ships of Chittim, that's a very mysterious term. Um, most people just interpret Chittim as meaning foreign. This, these are the foreign ships that come. 
And, you know, that is very true. But when we're talking about these ships of Chittim, we should be understanding this from the context of Ezekiel chapter 1, where in Ezekiel chapter 1, Ezekiel sees these discs that um, go about on their four sides, meaning that they're moving like Frisbees, and they come down from the heavens and they bring with them four living creatures. There's four discs that come down and each disc carries four living creatures. And the living creatures have the face of an ox, the face of a man, the face of a lion, and the face of an eagle. Those happen to be the four standards of the house of Israel. Now, Joseph Smith was talking to the saints in Ramos, Illinois. And if you can ever get your hands on a copy of any discourse that Joseph Smith gives to the saints in Ramos, Illinois, prepare to have your socks blown off because he he's, feels very comfortable with the saints of Ramos, Illinois. And he tells them incredible things that he tells nobody else. And one of the things that he told the saints in Ramos, Illinois was, listen, the reason that you have the ox and the lion and the eagle and a man as these beasts that are represented in John's revelation is standing before the throne of God are because all four of those did not originate on earth. They came to earth from other worlds. So that's, that's crazy. The standards of the house of Israel are represented by four different entities that came to the world, the earth from other worlds. So that is why I never would have believed any of this stuff, Phil, um, if I didn't do a deep dive into the scriptures myself. I mean, yeah, you, you go back before I wrote a remnant shall return. I never would have believed any of this. Uh, my journey down this, this road, it all started when I, I went to my parents. You know, I knew the scriptures. I thought I knew the scriptures very well. Um, you know, I used to play this game where you know, people would open up the Book of Mormon or, you know, and you know, they'd start reading and I'd tell them where they were reading from. I thought that I knew the scriptures well. But, and I went to my parents and I said, you know what? I have a hard time reading the scriptures now. I mean, as I'm reading, I know what the next verse is going to say. And the one after that, and the one after that, and, you know, how do I get anything out, you know, out of this? It's just, it, it has become stale. And my, it was my mom. She said, have you ever asked the Lord what you should be studying? what i mean i just read the scriptures from i read the book of Mormon from beginning to end and then i start over and i do it again and i do it again that's studying the scriptures right i mean we're, we're supposed to read the scriptures for 15 minutes a day i mean that's what i've been doing my entire life what do you mean ask the lord what i should study that was the first time i'm a full-grown adult man and my mom hits me upside the head for the first time in my life saying, have you asked the Lord what you should be studying? And that absolutely changed my life. Because when I asked the Lord what I should study, very clearly, the answer was my message or my son's message to the Nephites. So that's where I started. And that just opened, you know, up this, you know, can of worms that has just radically changed my view of reality um, and what the coming days look like. And the scriptures have absolutely gained a, a new depth and a beauty and a symmetry um, that I was astonished to realize has existed all along, but that I never saw because I 
only ever was engaged in a speed read of the scriptures. Let's finish the Book of Mormon by the end of the year. And, you know, you just, you, I mean, that's nice to be able to say you've done that a couple of times in your life. But um, when we're talking about good, better, best, that is not the best. It's not the best way to go about it. Um, Where did that's like? I'm, I'm go ahead. Everybody, and I'm sure everyone's trying to be empathetic to the fact that, you know, you had to memorize all the scriptures. That would have been so horrible, Mike. We all feel so bad for you that you've memorized the scriptures. <laughs> uh, well, it's I think it's, I think it's <laughs> wonderful, and I I love what you said, and and kudos to moms out there who sometimes uh, actually listen to the inspiration and, and say things like that. I, that's just amazing. I've never heard you say that before. Yeah, it's you know, it's it, it it's something that uh, I mean, it it changed my life. I'm I'm. You know, it's it's just something I had never thought of before. I, I I couldn't fathom that there was more to the scriptures than the surface reading, and now I see that there is so much more. It's it's astounding. I remember having a conversation with you once, um, and you told me that before you wrote your first book, A Remnant Shall Return you were thinking about taking the knowledge that you had learned and writing kind of a, a fantasy fiction type thing, right? Absolutely. I'm, I'm sure every person in this room and every person watching online is so grateful you didn't do that, Mike. <laughs> because, yeah. well, you know, I wrote this book. It's, it's actually, you know, I, I got to quite a ways through it. I called it Shadow Days. And I started so trying Read it to people to Wait, try to get it. What did you call it? You call shadow, it shadow days. Shadow days. You know, because you know, shadow days. Because you know, in the book of Revelation, when it's talking about the opening of the seventh seal, it talks about you know this fiery burning mountain that you know comes and you know hits the planet, and that um, the uh, the sun um, and that the heavenly luminaries shine but for a third of their strength so you know, that's where i got this idea of you know shadow days there's that there's less light but i tried to read this book to my kids and you know, everybody that i read to you know, and so it was the sign to me this isn't <laughs> this isn't what i'm supposed to do and so i just you know i i took a different route <laughs> well again um i know that there are thousands of people around the world that are grateful that you took a different route. Not that you couldn't have done a good job, but, you know, <laughs> leave it to the other crazies to write those types of books. Right, Mike? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> so a couple questions for you. So when do you anticipate your second book of Enoch is going to come out? Um, you know, I, I would think that it's probably going to come out. Um, you know, before the end of May. Before the end of May. Wow, that's sooner than I thought. Well, we are we're hoping to get um, our second book of Return from Risa out by before August. So hopefully uh, you'll still be able to to speak at our book launch. And uh, that would be exciting. We're not sure where we're going to do it or when, but it, it would be fun to have you come again and and you can talk about the crazies who did write the kind of stuff that you decided not to write. But <laughs> what an example and, and what a uh, a mentor you have been to to me and my co-author Rick Nelson when we wrote Return from Risa. And we really, really appreciate that. So Yeah. Well, yeah, it's been, you know, it's been great uh, being able to, you know, meet with you and Rick. And you know, I've met I've met so many uh interesting and you know awesome people um as a result of uh writing these books it's been it's been great well before i let you go i'm going to ask um our host if they have any other questions they would like you to answer before we end this is there anything else or or anyone else here in the room anyone else they're all kind of dazed well, i think <laughs> oh okay here 
so the question that I'm hearing is how many volumes are you anticipating on your book of Enix series? I think I can get it done in three. Um, I think that it will be in total, it'll be about a thousand pages of commentary, but I, th I think I should be able to get it done in three. That, that is really cool. Anything else? Anybody? Mike, you are awesome. We love you. We are so very grateful that you've listened to the counsel of your mom, your wise mom, and obviously that you listen to the Lord um, and you use this incredible gift you have of truly understanding scripture and being able to help others understand it through the way you write. So thank you so much. Was it, it was a pleasure talking with you again, Phil. This has been so awesome and we really appreciate it. So take care. Uh, give my love to your beautiful wife and your kids. And we will talk to you again soon, my friend. Okay. Thank you. Talk to you later.